Hello and welcome to Scots United, where I, Scott, and my team of Scots, who are also me, bring you the latest in movies, television, and popular culture. So, here we are. It's uh, the dregs of summer, and it's hot. And uh, that's, if you're wondering why, you know, Scott is shirtless half the time in our clips these days, it's because it's hot and I really try not to use air conditioning because it's a real energy suck and bad for the environment. But anyways, speaking of Midsummer, let's talk about Midsummer. Although the spelling is not quite the same. It's like M I D S O M M A R. I guess it's the Swedish spelling maybe. That's kind of where the movie's set. So, Florence Pugh is really big right now. She was in that Robert the Bruce movie on Netflix with Chris Pine where he showed his wiener. She was in the Little Drummer Girl miniseries. She's going to be in Little Women coming out soon. She's been in a lot, and she's, she's rightfully so. She's very good. Chris Pine's wiener. Yes. I, I'm with you. Go. She has just gone through, like, this grief experience that I will leave you to understand on your own. Don't want to spoil anything, but the movie definitely is focused in grief. Ari Aster, writer-director, who also did Hereditary, clearly likes to kind of soak and marinate in grief with his characters, which... Um, it's almost Lynchian in my mind. I think of Twin Peaks, I think of the Palmers and like the extremity of their grief and just sort of playing on the edge of where it's almost comical, but not. It's good stuff. Laura. <laughs> or uh, the mother was a uh... sweetheart. I mean, yeah, I mean, I love the capital letters, Twin Peaks, but, and those two performances are iconic. Yes, grief at that shaking, awful, terrible, almost comical level. I understand. Okay, proceed. So her boyfriend's kind of like, eh, about their relationship, but the whole tragedy makes him not be able to really remove himself, and then she kind of tags along on this trip that he and his anthropology master degree buddies are going to Sweden to this, like, village that one of his buddies is from that has this midsummer ritual, and... From there, it goes. But, gorgeously shot. The, the set design is incredible. Uh, the performances are all good. I don't think it's as scary and as intense as Hereditary, but Ari Aster likes a slow build, and he likes, to, he likes to build it and have it grow and have that sense of dread and fear grow. But there's something also kind of beautiful and contemplative and... Certainly ritualistic about Midsummer, um, which again is not shocking if you've seen Hereditary. Hail Payman! There's one moment later in the movie where the main character is just at a breaking point and she is so overcome she falls to the, the floor and like is just has is on her like on all fours. She can't she barely can breathe and she's but it's like She's finally letting it all out, letting everything out from all the, the grief that she's been experiencing. And these women around her get down on the floor with her and just match her for every breath, for every sound, for every scream in this act of support. And it was supremely moving and beautiful. And I just was blown away by this movie. We open on a lonely stretch of highway, not driving in the lane, but we are going to Mexico. And this girl, young woman, don't know her age exactly, her life is forever changed in some way. And we hear the song jump in that we'll get back to in a moment. Now a truck breaks through a wall, and look, it's Mackenzie Davis. You loved her in San Junipero, your favorite episode of Black Mirror. You probably didn't watch her in Cult and Catch Fire, even though that was on for four seasons on AMC, but whatever. And look, it's a Terminator movie. These Terminators are gunmetal gray, and they can duplicate themselves as it would appear since one's still driving, and it takes the shape of a kind of attractive Latino man, which is an interesting choice. And clearly she's something, because she doesn't have normal skin. And, okay, pin down, but yes, we all heard Linda Hamilton is back. Sarah Connor lives, because this is sort of a reboot sequel, and Look at her, she's tough, she's old, and she's not even breaking a sweat. Which, uh, 
It was like James Woods. I don't know. I'm not sure if I, if I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm behind this. So here we have our, our kind of core team. Now Cameron has come back to produce, but is it a guarantee that this will alleviate the stink of Terminator Genesis? I mean, this Terminator says that she's not, you know, a robot. She is human somehow, and you know, we also have. Uh, Arnold coming back and getting wedged into this, as we will see right here. How? Who knows? Because the timeline of these movies is so screwed. They've done all this nonsense, and it's like, how can they make any of this right or make any kind of sense? I don't know. Plus, this movie already feels derivative. <clears throat> the Latina-looking girl they're protecting, are we getting kind of shades of, of Logan, like dark hair and whatever? Are we getting shades of World War Z or... Or um, the last Batman movie with Bane in it, with the, 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 the and why is she wearing like a male carrier's outfit here? I don't know. I mean, this guy looks like I would like say yes to have a coffee with him. I don't think he feels like a Terminator to me. And then Dark Fate, Dark Fate. It's like Dark Fate. I just feel like it's hard to say. I just I don't know. It's too clunky. It's like what we were saying about the Disney live-action uh, re remakes. They're making them just different enough to seem different, but yet familiar enough to feel like the same thing. Which is a formula, and people pay for it, so I guess it works. But same thing here. It's like, we're going to give you the Terminator that looks like the metal exoskeleton, or endoskeleton, because it's in the inside. Whatever. But it, it looks like the, you know, the skeleton we're used to with the Terminator, like from part one. But it can all get goopy like the one from part two. And I think generally we're, they're going to have us just forget that three happened with Kristana Loken as like the laser firing T1 million. Dumb. Didn't even see that one. Or Terminator Salvation that Christian Bale did, which was in the future and he was John Connor. And I don't even remember what that even was about. And then, and then as I said, Genesis was just. Amelia Clark and uh, the other Clark, Jason Clark. It was all Chris Clark's all over the place. And no one cared, no one saw it. I don't know. I don't know. Terminator is a classic. Terminator 2 is one of those rare sequels that improves and builds upon the original and is, is a great movie. It still remains a great movie. Are we ever going to get back to having a Terminator movie that feels fresh and is a better and greater evolution of the series? No, that probably will, is not possible. Is this maybe a serviceable, decent action movie? Eh, I don't know, but I don't like it. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you for joining us, and we will be back next week with our review of Spider-Man Far From Home.